Hey everybody, I want to talk today about uh, the general rules in the Wesleyan spiritual tradition uh, and kind of why the rules are significant and uh, how they connect with larger movements that have existed within the church universal, within the church Catholic over the centuries. So uh, a few days ago I went to St. Joseph's Abbey near Covington, Louisiana for a planning retreat to try to uh, do a little bit of planning ahead on sermons and preaching and, and things like that. And it's a Benedictine monastery, and I stayed uh, with the brothers. I prayed some of the daily offices with them. I ate with them. And uh, during the meals, you don't talk to each other, but uh, you sit, you eat, and you listen as one brother reads from various uh, spiritual uh, and devotional books. And uh, at the end of the evening meal, I believe it was, maybe it was every meal, uh, we also had a reading from the Rule of St. Benedict. And every uh, religious order within uh, the Roman Catholic Church, certainly, and I think this is generally true of monks in Eastern Orthodoxy, though they don't have the same kinds of uh, religious orders like you see in the Western Church, uh, every religious order has a rule of life that gives it order, right? This is how we live. This is how we organize our lives to pursue Christ, to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, to live into our particular calling in this religious life. So in uh, the Benedictine Abbey, it's the rule of St. Benedict. Can you read that? The rule of St. Benedict, here's my copy. Um, it's, you know, not a, a particularly long book. This one's 96 pages. And, um, and the rule... Uh, gives sort of the framework to how a Benedictine monk lives and how a Benedictine monastery is run and what its priorities are and, and you know, how, how they operate things. And this is called a rule of life uh, or a monastic rule. And you see this with other groups as well. Um, I know I, a few years ago, read the rule of the uh, Society of St. Francis, which was a Franciscan uh, community or order within Anglicanism. It was one of the kind of revived, uh, there's been a revival in some uh, Anglicanism and Lutheranism, certainly, of some of the uh, medieval religious orders. And so uh, the Franciscan, the Society of St. Francis is one. And they have a rule of life that's based on the teachings of St. Francis and, and the rule of the Franciscan order in the medieval church. And the rule of life uh, kind of gives some framework about uh, what kind of uh, work to engage in, how to pray, when to pray, when to receive, and how often to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, and, and things like that. Um, so this is the rule of life, and it's what gives these religious orders their order. It's what uh, makes them a disciplined community, kind of marching in lockstep is the idea uh, to, to make a difference for the cause of the kingdom of God in, in uh, bringing uh, Christ and the world together. So with all of that kind of in mind, I want you to think about the Methodist revival movement. Uh, the great preacher of the Methodist revival movement was not John Wesley, but George Whitfield. And George Whitfield would go around preaching, and people would have conversion experiences. And then, uh, you know, Whitfield would tell them, now go to church, and then he would move on to the next community. John Wesley was not as uh, perhaps remarkable a preacher as Whitfield, but he did something similar. He went around preaching. People would commit their lives to Jesus Christ, sometimes longtime church members who just kind of been saying the words but never really giving their lives, their hearts, their minds, their all to Christ, would be converted, and they would come uh, truly uh, awake spiritually and, and give their all to Jesus. And John Wesley would then organize them. He would organize them into small groups, uh, classes, and bands, and he would give them a rule to live by. We call this in Methodism the general rules. And there are three rules that then kind of subdivide. So uh, the first rule is do no harm. And if you look in the Book of Discipline, for example, in the United Methodist Church, or just do a web search of the Wesleyan general rules, you can find these and you can read uh, all. So do no harm. Uh, and, and avoid every kind of evil, especially the evil that's practiced in the society around you. And then they give a lot of examples from the context of, of uh, England and America in the late 18th century. And it's like, you know, don't, don't fight, don't buy slaves, don't engage in smuggling, um, you know, don't uh, speak evil of magistrates. Some of these things are still very relevant. Um, don't put on costly or, you know, ostentatious apparel. 
uh, things like that. Avoid uh, entertainments that are uh, corrosive to your spiritual life or don't build you up, uh, these kinds of things. So do no harm. The second rule was do good. Do all the good you can uh, to people, to their bodies, and also to their spirits. Uh, teach the truth. Uh, it, he says, um, you know, go find your Christian brothers and sisters and, and do business with them, right, to help them uh, prosper materially. Do good especially to the household of faith. Uh, take up your cross uh, and, and do what you need to do. And then finally, the third of the general rules is attend upon all the ordinances of God. Uh, these are what are uh, sometimes called the, the instituted means of grace. This is um, the worship service. Go, go and worship every Sunday. Receive Holy Communion frequently. Indeed, weekly was the idea of the Wesley movement. Um, engage in regular Bible reading. Engage in regular, and we mean daily, uh, prayer and Bible study. Uh, attend the class meetings and gather with other Christians in a small group and pray for each other and, and share what's going on in your lives. Engage, and they call that holy conferencing. Engage in fasting or abstinence. All of these, uh, the word, the sacrament, fasting, small groups, these are the means of grace. These are the things that God uses to share his grace with us in our lives. And so... Um, these are the things that the Methodists were supposed to be doing on a regular basis, right? Weekly meetings, weekly communion, uh, daily prayer, daily Bible reading, uh, and, and you know, uh, frequent fasting. And then they would gather together and talk about, how are we doing? How, how am I doing living this rule of life? Have I harmed someone this week? Have I uh, harmed myself in some way this week? Have I uh, neglected to do good when I had an opportunity to do good. And they would talk about these things in their weekly meetings, and they would pray for each other. So they were confessing their sins to one another. That was also part of the rule uh, of life. And in this way, the Wesleyan Methodist movement within the Church of England, uh, within the Anglican Church, was a lot like a medieval religious order. And John Wesley kind of functioned like the sort of superior or abbot for this order. And the people were striving to conform their life according to the rule of life, the general rules, which were a way of working out our own salvation. And they explicitly call it that uh, in, in the kind of uh, preface or prologue to this attached to the general rules. Um, they're trying to, uh, to, to basically live a holy life and uh, pursue Christ and live in a way that pleases God. And so that's what the general rules are for. It's, it's so that the Wesleyan revival, and they weren't trying to start a new church. They were trying to revive the Anglican church, actually. And this is a key to a lot of the decisions Wesley makes. And it's not really until the American Revolution and kind of the, the end of the Church of England in the United States, because it was connected with the crown. The king is the head of, of the Anglican church. Um, so uh, it was not until then that, that really Methodism became a separate denomination. John Wesley wanted it to be a revival movement within Anglicanism and, and to work like a religious order, uh, bringing new vitality and new strength to the established church. And this was very much on the model of what you saw with uh, the medieval uh, monastic movements and revival movements and reform movements that existed in the medieval church. And this is one reason why uh, sometimes people accuse John Wesley of being sort of a closet Jesuit, because he, he had this kind of ordered way for his societies all to work that, that really did reflect a um, kind of a, a religious society or a, mon a monastic order. And I think uh, certainly Methodism, as we transitioned from a revival movement, from a religious society into a, a kind of established denomination, we really lost a lot of that. We lost a lot of that sense of discipline and that sense of, of kind of walking together in lockstep and working out our own salvation in, in intense community together, praying for each other, bearing up one another's burdens, confessing our sins to one another, uh, stuff the Bible teaches us to do, uh, which is difficult to do, is painful sometimes to do. Um, we've lost, Methodism has lost a lot of that, and it's, of course, been to our detriment. You know, it's, it's precisely as we've lost our discipline that we've also lost our, our spiritual power and our growth uh, over over uh, the decades. So I think part of the challenge in that is 
uh, to figure out what does it look like, especially as uh, Methodism is going to be reconfigured somehow in, in the next couple of years, and there's going to be schisms and new things happening, and maybe people are perhaps going to return to Anglicanism in some cases, and uh, going to form new denominations in some cases, and uh, different things like this. What does it look like to try to recapture that sense of we're a people who have a particular discipline that we live by, a rule of life? We are not simply, you know, kind of members of a church on paper and we come once in a while and, and show up on Sundays to receive, you know, kind of as sacramental consumers, as it were, but people who are part of a disciplined community living with a rule of life. And um, there certainly have been attempts, I've done this myself for myself, uh, been attempts to kind of update the general rules. What does it look like in our in our setting? Uh, what are the the forms of evil we're most easy, easily kind of tempted into in our culture? Um, certainly, the means of grace, the instituted means of grace, the spiritual disciplines are the same as they have been for for many centuries. Um, and I think that's really where it starts. Like a commitment to uh, love God, love my neighbor, avoid evil, reject temptation. It's all the membership vows kind of stuff. If you think about it, the baptismal vows combined with a, a disciplined a disciplined use of the means of grace, daily prayer, daily Bible reading, weekly worship, receiving the word through the sermon and in the, the Bible readings and the liturgy, receiving Holy Communion frequently, making regular use of fasting, getting together with other Christians for regular uh, conversation about how does it how, how goes it with my soul is the question they ask each other. Uh, we might say, how can I pray for you? Where are you struggling? Um, building that into our ethos going forward as, as individual Christians trying to uh, live as genuine Wesleyans, uh, trying to, which Wesley would just say genuine Christians, really, um, trying to, to really uh, pursue Christ in a thought-out, disciplined, and not haphazard and casual kind of way. So, um, yeah, the general rules— uh, do no harm, do good, all the good you can, and uh, use the instituted means of grace, the, um, the ordinances of God, and, and use this as a way of pursuing Christ, pursuing holiness, and growing in your faith, and do it together, do it in community. And I think figuring out how to do that in the 21st century is one of the great challenges, but also one of the great exciting opportunities that we have moving forward. So those are my thoughts on, uh, briefly, on the general rules as a, a rule of life and of the Methodist Wesleyan movement as a kind of religious order within the larger church universal. And I hope that that's something that excites you and, and sends you back to the general rules saying, what, is, what does this look like for me? What does it look like for me and maybe for my small group, my Sunday school class? What does it look like for us to pursue Christ, my local congregation, in a more disciplined and not haphazard kind of way? And I think if you really give some attention to those questions, some fruitful things can, can come out of that. If you liked this video, if it was helpful to you, I hope you will hit that thumbs up button. I hope that you will share it with other people. And uh, until we connect again, may the Lord bless you and give you peace. Amen.